a series of lectures over the weekend by New York Times columnist Brett Stevens. Mm -hmm. um, and he said something interesting, which is that he feels that the media should help restore uh, the American people to a sense of citizenship over partisanship. So, Christina, what would that look like? What is that? Um... Well, I'd like to answer the last question, actually, because everybody else had an opportunity to. I, um, I totally respect where you guys are coming from, but for me, like, I'm in this business because I think that democracy is like the most important thing on the planet and I've always felt like covering politics and government has been a way to help enlighten people and inform them so that they can take that vote that they, you know, people have died for and express it. And so for me, like, I, I love voting. I take pleasure in voting. I will, if people ask me my vote, I talk to them about it. You know, you tell I, people who you voted for too? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm yeah. Really, my, feeling, Jake, my feeling is this is what I do. Right. I don't expect other political well, organizations. Well, sure, but a lot of yeah. people feel that way. And I've yeah. actually, but I, had, I don't think it's a right or wrong. I for me, don't. I feel like I, I'm, if I've covered this race, like I'm probably the most informed voter. Like that's what I strive for every day. Like, so mm -hmm. I, I would that's like to exercise that. Um, but at the same time, I also believe that that doesn't mean I have an agenda, right? Like I make personal decisions in my life every day. I buy Cheerios over cornflakes or whatever that is. and. That doesn't reflect on my journalism. I get hate mail from both sides every single day. I have worked on the left, I have worked on the right, I have been called right wing, I've been called left wing, and my own personal opinions do not influence what I do. People might not believe that, and that's part of the issue of like that's trust the issue, and everything yeah. else, yeah, right? That's the issue. And so that's why I'm yeah. never gonna be out there championing a cause. I really try to keep the snark down, and sometimes it's hard, right? You know, when particularly when you're under this barrage from the president, but I tell our journalists all of the time, like you are representing the organization. Anything you do can undermine the credibility of this organization. It doesn't matter if you're a food writer or a science writer or a political journalist. Like keep that out of there. You don't need to. You can. can put I, and I want to add to, in defense of journalism. I got dropped into the CNN presidential debates because the GOP party insisted on having a center-right journalist commentator be on the panel asking questions because in the last round all the liberals asked set up questions of Romney and Candy Crowley actually gave the election to Barack Obama in my humble opinion when she interrupted Mitt Romney and they made fun of him when he warned about Putin and Russia. I mean there's so many ironies but I will tell you in the debate prepped with CNN they are the greatest group of professional journalists I have ever had a chance to work with. They worked and worked and worked to get it right. They did not attempt to manipulate my questions. But in the end, you're running a show. So there's a little man in your ear who's like the offensive coordinator in an NFL game going, you've got the ball, Hewitt, you can throw it to A, B, or C. And the follow-up has to go to D, E, or F because they've got to keep the time constraints within a band of 100%. So, you, you, so Trump can't get 20 minutes and Carly Fiorina get two. So, but they're running a fair game. CNN runs a fair game, but when Don Lemon goes on a rant about the president, he destroys the entire brand right, of the CNN. Point. Thank you. Yeah. That's, that's the Twitter point to me, too. Yeah. Thank okay, you. so let's Thank go you. back to this question, this idea that Brett Stevens has about citizenship over partisanship. How can the media contribute to an environment where your what you said that we, we cover government, we cover politics because there's this idea that you're helping you're helping embolden and bolster you have democracy. To help people understand what their government does for them or doesn't do for them, right? Like we know that people don't participate in local elections, particularly here in LA. I mean it's awful, really so bad. embarrassing, that really dramatically affect their lives. And so that is incumbent upon us to help people understand these are human beings with policies that affect you in your home, at your workplace, whatever that is. And so that's by you know, giving as much information as you can, pulling in the context, and then helping people get there, understand that they need to participate and why it's important for them. And when they feel like it doesn't matter, that's also, I think, part of the media's responsibility. You have to help them see, you know, I use the example all the time, Eric Cantor lost his seat in the primary in Virginia because of 7,212 people, right? Like those people organized, this was a district just like LA where people say, oh, I don't vote because my vote just doesn't matter here. Like anybody living outside of Richmond in Virginia thought, well, this is a Republican district, it's never gonna matter. And actually Dave Bratt won that race, completely changed the direction of the Republican party forever. Country perhaps. <laughs> right. Yeah. And for 7,212 people. I mean, Bernie Sanders became mayor in his first race by like 14 votes or something, right? Like there are 
actual things that you can show people that they matter as individuals. And so that's the philosophy I take with me to my job, but it's different for everyone, and everybody has different purposes and different audiences they're trying to serve. I mean, is it implicit in what he's saying by saying that we shouldn't do the kind of reporting that you were asking Jake about before? In other words, I think that kind of report is not, it's not one or the other. I mean, I think you do want to cover the sort of you know, rat -a -tat -tat, you know, trivial, demoralizing stuff that's going on, but you also want to cover the big stuff that makes people understand why government's important, who these people are, and what they're doing. I don't and think also, it's one or the like, other. I think also what we, what we do and what a lot of people do in, in covering Congress is cover these people as people. And right. um, I think that's important to know that, uh, you know, Steve Scalise isn't just a face on, on TV, he's somebody with a family, and when, you know, when he was shot, I mean, I, reporters in the Capitol knew him and, and had written about him as a person. And I think in what, what Politico does and how I think, frankly, I think Politico, not because of me or anyone I work with, but has changed journalism in a way that it is a lot about personality and, and how personality influences policy and politics. So I actually think that's, I mean, I think that's a critical part, part of, of yeah. political journalism. Well, that's also part of what contributes to this culture where you want to be on a winning team, right? You want to be on the, you're picking a side, you're, you want to be on a winning team. And so I think he's speaking to the idea that we're more invested in which side of the political spectrum we're on, which team we're on, how is our team doing? It also speaks to this idea of like our obsession with numbers and polling and who's winning and who's losing, that we lose sight of what we share in common as citizens of American democracy. But I want to stop there for a moment and move to a new subject. Just out of curiosity, how many people in this room are Jewish? <laughs> um, I think we've seen, because this of course is a, a Jewish event and a Jewish conference, um, and I am a Jewish journalist, I'm very interested in the sort of uptick in public displays, our discussion about anti-Semitism. Uh, in the last number of months, maybe a year and a half or so. Um, and in particular, I, I know the New York Times has published a series of articles suggesting that there's been an uptick. And there was a recent article in the Times Magazine that described this moment in America as one in which, quote, being Jewish suddenly feels threatened in a way that it hasn't in decades. So want to ask you guys and gals, um, what are the factors responsible for this new threat and how has the current political environment uh, trumped up these, these feelings, uh, no pun intended? Let me go to bat first because I'm not Jewish. My children are part Jewish and my, uh, if, if they're Nefflers from Indiana or Tossigs from St. Louis, my children are related to you, but I, uh, I am very concerned. Donald Trump is not responsible for this. I want to be very, very clear. Anti-Semitism in Europe began to peak about 20 years ago. It is now spread into the American left in a way that is uh, uh, deeply disturbing. And a lot of it has to do with the rise of the radical Wahhabist mentality. A new book is out called American Icon by a patriotic American Muslim who's an FBI bureau agent and has been busy breaking up jihadi plots in the United States. And it is chilling how jihadis think. They don't, they're not influenced by Donald Trump. Uh, the, the, the jihadi hatred of the Jews and the Crusaders has got nothing to do. They hated Obama as much as they hated Bush as much as they hate Trump. So a lot of the anti-Semitism in America that is coming from the Wahhabist fringe and being glommed onto by the left is European in its origin and Middle Eastern in its origin. And I reject, others might disagree, I reject that has anything to do with Trump. Do you agree, do you disagree? What are, what are we seeing? Um, we certainly have seen, you know, uh, white you know, nationalism have a, have a broader platform. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know that that's fair to describe anything to it. There has always been hatred in America and it's directed in a lot of different ways. It is, I am not Jewish, I have many friends who are and I have seen people profoundly um, disturbed by the personal attacks. I mean, it actually goes back to social media. I mean, you've seen just some really chilling, disgusting things that people are saying about people. And they're also saying it about journalists I work with who are Indian, or my best friend who's from Afghanistan and is or practicing women being Muslim. Attacked. Right, being I mean, women. there is just, it is a, there's a level of discourse that is like below ground, and it's really gross. And, um, you know, people, I think it's also important that when you put yourself out there as a government worker, as a journalist, as a politician, like you're exposing yourself and your family to a lot. 
and you're taking a risk in, in that sense. And um, you know, it doesn't matter what religion you are, no one, sh that shouldn't matter, right? Like that's the point, that's the, one of the beautiful things about America. And um, so yeah, I just, I, I don't know what it's due to, but it is loud, and I think that that's in part it's due to social media. Probably, yeah, I was gonna say, it's probably encouraged and facilitated by social media. Yeah. It's easier for pe stuff that normally you never would hear people say, it's easier to hear because of Twitter right. and Facebook. And well, what like do you that. think? What, what, what do the two Jews on the panel think? I, I have no idea what, what is um, uh, fostering this environment. I will say, you're right, like, I, I do get stuff on Twitter that's just disgusting. And I don't know what it, I have no idea why. Um, I don't, in my job, like, I don't wear being Jewish. <laughs> like, it's not, I don't cover Israel, -ish. I don't cover Middle Eastern issues, I don't cover Jewish issues. So, uh, I don't know what, why, but it's definitely pronounced. I mean, have you gotten anything like of that nature? No, I'm not. Oh. I'm not. I I've been advocating for Luther Strange to resign uh, as a way for the Republicans to hang on to the Alabama seat. And the abuse that I got from the left yesterday, Rick Perlstein, he's a historian, called me a monster. A monster. And I just thought to myself, it's, it's, people have lost all sense of proportionality and balance when it comes to politics. And I blame cable news. I don't blame newspapers. They're the same they were. The LA Times has got its biases. The other, and I don't blame talk radio. I think it's Fox News and MSNBC ginning up the base 24-7. And if, my God, if they ever acquit Trump of being uh, associated with Russia, it won't stop. I think there's so many guilty people in the Russia circle, but I also think the Steele dossier was a Hillary Clinton hit piece. So it's the most interesting story in the world right now. I mean, I could go hours on this story, but no one hears any detail they find inconvenient. And if you advance a story, line that they are not in agreement with, you will be attacked personally as being an, a puppet of uh, whichever side you're against. So Christina, you worked in, I understand, Palo Alto a little bit, or you were in San Jose, I, so I grew up in San Jose. you have some experience, uh, I guess, with Silicon Valley, and I think that that's certainly been a huge factor um, in when, when we, we, can, we can no longer divorce the, the power of Facebook and Google and Twitter when we're having a conversation about politics. So how do you see the relationship between Washington and Silicon Valley evolving? And certainly maybe you might want to address a little bit of the, the implications of Facebook possibly, you know, impacting the outcome of the election sure. and well, what that means. You know, I, I watched in fascination the hearings, um, you know, with these big social media companies on Capitol Hill, right? There's, um, and then somebody, I, I was on a panel where somebody asked me, like, well, shouldn't they be regulated like media companies? And it's like, these are not unregulated companies. Like, let's be clear, these are massive mega corporations that have a lot of regulations. Do they have the same obligation as a media company? You know, is that some rule written somewhere? I side very much on the personal responsibility part of this. Like, yes, it's terrible that Facebook sort of filters you into the like happy bubble of kid pictures and liberal stuff if you're a liberal and whatever else on this side, but like, there are lots of ways to get other information. We have more information available to us on both sides than ever before. You won't believe that when you finish World Without Mind. Yeah, Does it concern the rest of you that, that, that Facebook plays such a dominant role in the dissemination of, of news media today? I mean, I confess about I, I agree with you on the, on, the, on the way it sort of focuses people on certain, one's kind of stream of news. I just confess the bias that it's an economic threat to my well-being. <laughs> so I'm not sure I could objectively speak. I, um, and I kind of freaky. I, I use, I'm really into Twitter and Instagram for what it's worth. I've always been a little creeped out by Facebook. I always have been. I mean, I... Um, Why? I just feel it's too... Um, it's... It, I, I, it, it's just sort of the idea that I'm just reading stuff that just seems so repetitive or too personal or too, I mean, one of the things I love about the New York Times and the, you know, the LA Times, Washington Post, the political is that like I pick up the paper and get a sense of everything that's going on or with editors like, around the world. I don't get that sense from Facebook. I just get the sense of like some friend out there going, this is a really cool story, you should read it. I just don't. I, I, sorry, Jake, I hadn't thought about the pernicious impact until you were talking about it. Now it is pernicious. I think that the news media got its, like, we shouldn't really be, in my view, this isn't probably an unpopular opinion, I'll just preface it with that. I don't think, I don't have much use to spend time on whether, on what Facebook means and what Twitter means and what it's doing to our world because it's out of my control. So there's nothing, I can't make them go away and I can't make them, I can't bring us back to a time where uh, 
and I'm not just saying it's good or bad, but when the New York Times and the Washington Post right, dictated was what was on the I can't bring us back to that time. So I guess all I could do is just keep doing my job. And Although there's a, there's a sense, Jake, you could become part of the trust bus. I've become a trust buster. Uh, I think that we have to break up Facebook and Google. I think that they've achieved such economic monopoly that, and, and billionaires, in an age of Citizens United, which is correctly decided. What would, have, what would regulation of Facebook look like? Uh, you, you probably have to break up, as they did AT&T, I was, I was around when AT&T was broken up and the baby bells and the baby bells themselves dissolved into a bunch of different things. They have different core businesses that have to be disaggregated and it's an antitrust issue that's above my pay grade. But I will say this, when the railroad finished its transcontinental railroad, it was 17 years from the golden spike to the birth of the Interstate Commerce Commission because they were too big, too powerful, and too private. These companies are enormous and in an era of Citizens United, Michael Bloomberg has $70 billion, Jeff Bezos has more, Tom Steyer hasn't got quite as much. The Supreme Court got the case right, but we could become a, a country run, its politics run by a handful of people. It's a very dangerous thing to concentrate that much money. This is a fascinating and provocative idea, and I think we could have an entire panel just on that, but I've been told we only have a very few minutes left, so I want to ask two final things. Very quickly, each of you, just give us a brief sense of your media diet. What do you read? What sources do you turn to that are alternative to the political views that you hold? Um, I don't know if that's too revealing a question, so obviously Adam's not going to answer that one, and neither is Jake. But talk to us, tell us maybe, Jake, I'm curious even for you, like what, what are your other sources to get political news? How do you get sort of a, a larger sense of the landscape? What, do you, what are you all reading to uh, keep yourself informed? I uh, his newsletter, uh, Chuck Todd's newsletter, um, L.A. Times, Ch Shelby, Shelby Grads. Oh, not and mine? Benji, and your newsletter, I do. <laughs> um, Essential politics, everyone. Um, Sacramento Bee, because I cover California. Um, L.A. Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. Um, and then mostly from there, I get stuff through links through Twitter, you know, which I guess is sort of what yeah, I was Twitter criticizing. Yeah, Twitter is good at, at sharing information. Yeah. You gave me the advice when I started doing Playbook to read The Guardian, which I, I do. Uh, but I, I mean, my job is half reading everything and putting it into yeah. a newsletter. So I read, I mean, I subscribe to almost every paper, big paper in the country. Um, do you yeah. read it at night or do you wake I up early and read it? I read it in the morning. You do? Yeah. Um, Wait, we live weird lives. I'm on yeah. Hughes' radio show usually at 6 o'clock in the morning, so <laughs> we, we have a very early morning relationship. <laughs> I, I have a discipline. Hugh, what do, what do you wish, what do you wish um, our audience here today would read that, they're, that they may not it's be currently it's reading? It's expensive. It's expensive. But The Guardian, The Times of London, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, Politico, Roll Call, and The Hill are what I have read before I begin my show. Oh, but when and will we have time for Netflix? Uh, that, right, yeah. that's, <laughs> I, I only watch one show at a time for that reason. But I think the thing that's even more important is books still move you. Lawrence, Lawrence O'Donnell's book on 1968, it's called um, Playing with Fire. I've learned more about Eugene McCarthy and Bobby Kennedy in 180 pages. I yeah. read it on the plane yesterday. Yeah. Books still matter more than anything yeah. else, and they're dying. Yeah. So um, I have a 10-month-old who has figured out how to hit the delete button on my iPhone, which makes it really hard to read anything in the mornings until I get to work. So my diet, I actually take the bus here in LA, which is like pretty unusual. Wow. Um, I have 28 minutes, so I start with the Daily, which is the New York Times podcast, and it's excellent. Um, and then I like to read the... Um, the, or listen to the NPR one because you know it's like just my commute and I feel like I get kind of a pretty well-rounded thing like it's usually an in-depth story it's and often podcast. an interview yeah. with um, you know one of the Times journalists about a story that's hot like the Weinstein stuff like that was one of the best ways to get the information was from the podcast I thought okay I hear they're wrapping up in the room next door so final thing 15 30 seconds are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of our country Jake <laughs> And sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Indifferent. No, I'm kidding. Um, optimistic. I think we have like an elastic democracy. So if you don't like it now, you will like it at some point. If you do like it now, you <laughs> won't like it at some point. So I just think, uh, I think he was right. Like things are just totally out of proportion. Uh, the re our reaction to things are just, in my view, I know a lot of people don't agree, are out of proportion. Uh, some of us a little bit different. I'm basically a very optimistic person. I really believe in this country. I really believe in good things and the goodness of people. And you know, that's just my faith in the way I am. I will say that I've never been as concerned about our country 
as I am now. And this is not a Donald Trump thing, it's just sort of the state of Washington, the state of our politics. We just, I, I, guess, I guess I differ with you on that. But again, I'm an optimistic person, I just think was that things could always only get better. You? I'm very pessimistic because our, our enemies know the web so much better than we do, the North Koreans, the Chinese, the Russians, and they're manipulating us and causing, they're winning. Putin wanted division in the country. He got it in spades with his play. And uh, it's just beginning the, the, to think that they aren't doing it from the other uh, enemies of the country is to be naive. So I'm very pessimistic. Individually, we got a nice 10 years coming up. We're going to make a lot of money. But uh, I have grandchildren, and I do not have any clue what kind of world they're going to have when they're 60 years old. I'm, I'm individually and long-term optimistic, but I think we're in for some dark years ahead, in, especially in politics. Now, it is not, that pendulum has not hit that other side yet. It will. Sorry. On that high note, um, I just want to remind everyone, um, actually this is an optimistic note, the next session, please stay here, is going to be about the ways that the Federation is actually working on the policy level in Washington to uh, make our democracy and our world better, so stay for that. And finally, I would like to invite you to give a round of applause to our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Good fun. Thank yeah, you. thank you. It's really fun. You take the bus.